So there are a lot of different mutations that have been um, discovered in people with acute myeloid leukemia and cytogenetic changes we've known about. And I, I think what can be a challenge is taking this ever-shifting uh, amount of data and then applying it to the next patient you see. And so I think most of us have set up some kind of uh, algorithm for how we evaluate patients with acute myeloid leukemia. For example, at Duke University, we look at things that we need immediately for treatment planning and then other things where we might be able to wait. And so, for example, at the time of diagnosis, we follow the 2017 ELN guidelines and get an um, aspirate and a biopsy. Now, keep in mind, if the biopsy is a dry tap and you have 100,000 white cells and they're all blasts, you don't really need to get uh, a, a good bone marrow aspirate. You could do all the tests I'm about to talk about on the blood. So you need a, a hematopathologist um, looking at the slides. You need uh, flow cytometry for immunophenotyping. Uh, one reason is just for making the diagnosis. The second reason might be, and we'll talk about it later, um, identifying a leukemia-associated immunophenotype that you might use later on for MRD assessments. Maybe I'll turn to Dan later for, for that discussion. You also want to get cytogenetics. But what do you need in molecular tests? But the question is, what do you need right at the time of diagnosis? And in my opinion, what you would really like to know is, does the patient have core binding factor translocations, 1517 of APL, and, or complex changes, uh, five and seven abnormalities that make you uh, think of myelodysplastic related cytogenetic changes. Cytogenetics may take some time, so we have developed a rapid turnaround for FISH analysis that can give us much of that data. So we'll do FISH so that we get the data quickly within a couple of days uh, to allow us to do treatment planning. And we could talk more about what sets of patients we might use different therapies. The, uh, the molecular markers that you need at the time of diagnosis are really just FLT3 and IDH1 and 2. And those are best done by PCR because in, at our institution, probably I'll ask you about yours, the turnaround time is quicker. But I agree with you, Eunice, we also have to get a next-gen panel and the reason for that is these markers have become prognostically important for planning future therapies, such as does the patient need a transplant? But you might not need them right away. There's definitely argument considerations of how many different markers you need on those panels, but there are consensus about some of the ones that are important. In ELN guidelines, RUNX1, TP53, and ASX01 have been associated with a poor prognosis, so those are very important to get. And the more, if you were to do those by PCR, you'll quickly get to a point where it's actually cost savings to do them by next-gen sequencing. So you can argue about how big your panel is, but it should have at least the markers that are recommended by NCCN and ELN. And of course, the other reason for getting PCR at baseline of FLT3 and IDH1 and 2 is that at least for FLT3, um, you get a quicker turnaround time and NGS panels may sometimes miss large um, internal tandem duplications. So that's what we do at the time of diagnosis. I guess my final point on this would be in the vast majority of patients with AML, you can wait to get this information. I mean, of course, you have to move your pathologist along and tell them what's important in real time, but you can get this done quickly. So I'm going to um, uh, now turn back to Eunice and say, well, do you agree with this, and how quickly do you get your results? So I, I completely agree with that, uh, Harry. At, at our institute, we, we do use the single analyte PCR, and we are um, really um, emphasizing the turnaround time for FLT3 and IDH1, IDH2. Um, we both know that there are targeted therapies which are commercially available now for those, and in fact, there are some therapies that we're now testing, uh, both uh, in the upfront setting. So having those results back before day eight or early on in the treatment process can be essential for clinical trial enrollment, as well as for initiating those FLT3 inhibitors uh, in frontline therapy, which I'll talk about a little bit later. At our institute, um, we have the uh, the uh, uh, good, uh, good availability of these uh, molecular diagnostics lab, which is just down the street. So we get the FLT3, IDH1, IDH2 turned around uh, on within two or three days. They run the test Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for us. Once you move to a commercial lab, uh, regardless of which commercial lab that you use, you're going to have additional delays because you have to send the sample out. So um, that is, uh, by definition, an outside commercial lab is going to be adding anywhere from 24 to 72 hours 
uh, to your turnaround time depending on where that weekend falls and you collect the sample. Um, for that reason, really moving forward, it would be best to, to not have that additional two to three day turnaround because then that makes the, t the results really not available to the clinician. We're talking to realistically seven to 10 days. Uh, and for me, in my perspective, that can be a little bit too long uh, when you're trying to decide on therapy, whether you're gonna add a FLT3 inhibitor, um, but also what baseline chemotherapy you're gonna give because some chemotherapy regimens you can add and some you can't. And if you've already started a cytotoxic regimen, it may not be possible seven or 10 days later to add that beneficial uh, drug on top of it. So, so that's our, our impression of, or my impression of the importance of these tests. Um, I think there are some questions about uh, really which tests uh, because of cost issues, insurance coverage, and availability need to be uh, done at, the, at different times in the treatment course. I think that's really important because nowadays it really isn't one size fits all in terms of what regimen you give frontline. There are patients that would be really benefited from 7 and 3 alone or other patients that might be benefited by 7 and 3 with gemtuzumab and other patients who might be benefited by 7 and 3 plus mitostorin or even uh, CPX351 instead of 7 and 3. Mm -hmm. And now we need to really figure out what's the best regimen for the patient, and often these genetic tests are driving that choice. So you need enough information to make a regimen choice. You don't want to be partway through that and say, oh, wait a second, I want to add this, but I've already committed. You really need to have enough information to commit to a regimen. And at the same time, you can't wait weeks and weeks and weeks before you commit to anything. Patients need treatment. So I, I generally agree with exactly what you said, that in many patients we have you know, a few days to maybe a week to get information if they're clinically stable. Um, but in some patients who really have aggressive disease, we certainly want to get therapy started that we can add another agent to if it makes sense. And that's been our approach, certainly for FLT3 mutations, where we have about a week to get that information, but we don't want to be going longer than a week with any tests that's turning around. So I agree with you. I think it's really important to get PCR testing back in that first week of therapy because we can start 7 and 3 and add mitostorin to it. Um, and feel comfortable that we're giving the right therapy starting at day eight. And I would add to add that, that I mean, I think it's important to, to emphasize that these waiting, it's not just that we think that there, it, it's okay to wait. It's important nowadays, certainly because of the treatment options, but it's been documented. There have been studies that have shown that waiting those few days because of the additional information that you gain, and even more so when it impacts your treatment approach, is it doesn't adversely impact the outcome. It's not just that we think that it doesn't impact. So I think it's important to educate, educate our patients to, to, to say, you know, it's fine, we will monitor, you transfuse them in supportive care and all of that, of course, but, 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 uh, but, but, but the weight is, I think, justified and, 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 and actually more and more critical uh, because of the information you gain, except for the few exceptions of the very proliferative uh, patients. Um, a couple of things that I think we, would be valuable to, to bring up is, one of these is that the reports nowadays still vary greatly from lab to lab. So it's sometimes it's a little hard to, to understand what the lab is telling you. We all become familiar with our own labs and we know how to read them, but sometimes you get these reports from outside of patients refer to you and you read those reports and they're, they're difficult to read. Uh, and some of the elements that, are, that we're valuing more is there are, we need to recognize that there's sometimes variants that are not the mutations that we recognized as having prognostic or therapeutic implications, and it's important to recognize them. Um, and also, the importance of the, value, uh, the variant allele frequency for some of these mutations that may uh, have particularly prognostic implications and maybe even some therapeutic implications in, in some instances. And, and I think more and more it's going to become critical to make these reports uniform across different labs. There has to be some entity that, that regulates that so that we, we all get the same information in the same format um, and then understand it well so that we know what, what that means and, and when it's a real mutation, when it's a variant, and then what to do with these variant and these frequencies. I think when we talk about some of the therapeutic implications, we can discuss that further. But I think it is important to recognize that these, uh, these in addition to just the presence of a mutation, what this means. Yeah, I think you all, all bring up very important points here, and I, understanding these reports can be challenging. The place where the variant allelic frequency may be most important is in FLT3, um, ITD, where the European Leukemia Net now actually uses that to help stratify um, risk in AML patients. Hasn't quite caught on. There are some challenges in, in uh, standardizing those assays the way they're done, but 
clearly it does seem to carry some importance. So again, another good reason for doing PCR analysis of FLT3 ITDs at the time of diagnosis.